Welcome to Cast Dice, the podcast that explores the great big wild world of tabletop gaming. It has been said many times, uh, mostly on this podcast, that we are in the middle of a gaming renaissance. There are just too many good games out there that, you know, that we can spend our hobby time or our hobby dollars on. It, it can be sometimes really hard to know what to play next. Uh, and that's, I guess, the purpose of this podcast is to talk about big industry events that have been going on, uh, local gaming events, uh, and or, you know, the, the games that my guests and I have been playing slash writing um, and, you know, just talk about and explore tabletop gaming in general. And uh, that is what we are going to do today. Now, if you have listened to this show at all in the past, you will know this man. Um, he is a reoccurring guest. And not only is he probably one of the guys I play most, although we haven't played very much recently. Got to fix that. Um, he is one of the nicest guys who is also one of the most analytic gamers I have had the pleasure of playing. Um, you would know this man as Lee Avery. Lee, how you doing? Good, thanks, Brad. How are you? Another beautiful day, my friend. Welcome back to Cast Dice. How you doing? I'm good. It's uh, a lovely chilly day in Melbourne today. I was going to say, are you staying warm? I am. I uh, I rug up. I've, I've got some new knitwear. Oh, nice, nice little jumper and scarf combo mm -hmm. going. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, people in the States are sweating at the moment. Uh, and that goes for our good friend Pat, who's over there traveling at the moment. But um, my God, yeah. I, I talk to my relatives back back in the States, and they're talking about how ugly the weather is. And then, uh, you know, I, I walk outside, and I am I don't think I've been this cold in years. Yeah, it's it's been a late winter snap, I think. Yeah. And... Uh, we moved house. Uh, for those who uh, are longtime listeners of the fan, uh, sorry, fans of the show, um, I moved from my longtime city dwelling. My wife and I moved to the Burbs, uh, and we moved from an apartment building to a freestanding house, which is very exciting. I have my own game room, which I am now podcasting from. And um, on the weekend, I finally finished unpacking. So uh, I am hoping to have. Uh, the proper video streaming perm uh, equipment permanently uh, installed in the next week. And I'm hoping to start uh, videoing some of the games that we talk about on this podcast, which I'm very excited about. But Lee, you are also moving. And yes. um, I hear that your hobby has been <laughs> supplying. Um, I'll let you tell the story. Uh, yeah, mm. well, so what's your hobby been, Lee? Yeah, oh, so well, I haven't got much uh, hobby itself done lately. I've played, played a couple of games here and there, but... Um... And run some events, but uh, mm -hmm. my sort of hobby room late uh, time spent because I'm moving in a few weeks as well, out mm -hmm. of an apartment into a house. So yeah. similar circumstances. I won't have a uh, podcasting room though, not quite that exquisite. Uh, but I was packing stuff slowly out of the hobby room, and it's amazing how much you're accumulating cupboards and under desks and such. And <laughs> Don't know my, what you uh, mean. Urgh. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's a constant struggle. Yeah. And uh, my lovely wife came in looking for some lightweight boxes to fill out a, mm. another box she'd partially filled. And without having to leave my chair, I just sort of reached under the desk and pulled out a couple of, you know, inbox Hannah mags from Warlord. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, oh, no, I need a bit more. So I opened up a cupboard and got out some blister packs. And she's like, oh, probably a little bit more reach back into another cupboard, pull out a few more little boxes. And mm -hmm. yeah, without having to leave my chair, it was uh, amazing <laughs> how much I just sort of handed over without uh, batting an eyelid. I did ask for no judgment prior to getting things out. Yes. We See, both have our hobbies, so yeah. there's a bit of understanding there. Yeah, my I don't think my wife quite has that understanding or that level of hobby because there's a lot of judgment when I start pulling out boxes like that. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, let's talk about some of the games that you have been playing. Because you mentioned you've been playing quite a few. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the games um, that we've been playing, and unfortunately, I kind of missed the last open day for Warlords of Erewhon because I had just come back from the States and was moving house. Um, talk to us about that. Because um, we get together with a group of friends every five or six weeks. And we get together and play two to three games of Warlords of Erewhon, um, usually three. And it's, it's not really a tournament so much as just organized gameplay. Um, there aren't trophies or anything else. And you ran the most recent one. Um, tell us a little bit about it, because I think you took an interesting army, and um, yeah. I'm yeah, curious. so I think it's the third one we've had recently. So mm -hmm. yeah, this time uh, I think we had 
few of us turn up. We just thought let's let's play smaller points values, and so we can just try something different. So mm. we've sort of done eight hundred this time around. We went uh, seven hundred, I think we did. Mm. Yeah, and we decided to play on four by four tables instead of four by six, just because less forces. You know, most people are running sort of five to eight dice. Totally. You know, for that sort of size mm -hmm. and. A few of us took, I suppose, what you'd call skewy armies. Mm -hmm. um, so I took a all Slayer, Dwarf Slayer list. So cool. Um, it looks cool. It's It sounds good. Uh, when they hit, they can hit well. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, very low armor. They, they, they got pretty minced. Just even, you know, bows, bows and arrows from the undead were taking them down and... You know, yeah. I didn't do too well overall. So I had uh, one game against Jonathan, and he was running uh, the opposite skew of dwarfs, very heavy armor mm -hmm. and a gyrocopter. Uh, I, of course, running slayers, had no ranged weapons, so I couldn't do anything about his gyrocopter. So I just sat oh. there throwing bombs at me the whole game, which was exciting. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, he's armor, heavy armor. So I was swinging in and causing hits, but just not quite breaking through. So found the casualties were a bit one-sided. I think the slayers are definitely... Probably better against lighter armored foes. Certainly oh, yeah. playing against marks undead after mm -hmm. that. Uh, charging any units of skeletons was fine. Um, but I found weight of numbers took me down a bit. Yeah. If I was down a couple of guys, really sort of missed the attacks. So Totally. Yeah, it was good. We had a few few good games, a couple of multiplayer games, a couple of singles, and um, just sort of gave it a bit of a bit of a different run. Well, you, you, you're kind of skirting around sort of the elephant in the room as far as um, a lot of people in gameplay of uh, Warlords goes, and that is dwarves slash heavy armor armies. Mm. Um, I know a lot of people talk about them being problematic, um, and not, not everyone has, I guess, the tools to always deal with them. Um, I've been trying to add some bits and pieces to my forces, not to cater per se, um, but to have a tool or two in the old toolbox. And at first, that made me think, uh, maybe the game isn't balanced. Maybe it isn't, you know, maybe it isn't right. Um, something needs to be fixed. But then that got me thinking of, I guess, the early days of bolt action when we were talking about, you know, people were taking a heavy tank and then, you know, they were taking some infantry. And as you were um, playing other people, all of a sudden you were like, oh my God, I've never seen that before. How do I deal with that? And. Um, you start adding things to your list like AT or back in the day you'd have ATRs or possibly an HE weapon just so you had some sort of answer um, to, you know, if you face those things on the tabletop. And, I mean, how many times have I played Warlords of Erewhon and how many times have I played against heavily armored dwarves? Um, look, it's probably on the heavier side because um, mm. I've played against you quite a bit and i played against Dave with his and i played against... Um, other people using my own, as in they were, they were using my army against me. So I played against dwarves quite a bit, but there are quite a few armies that have great tools, and I think you just need to be aware that those they're they're strong, but they're also, as you say, very light on numbers. And um, I think warlords definitely has a an aspect of weight to it that we don't often see with the smaller point games that we're playing. I think if we played maybe with the full thousand points and people had the tools, mm. maybe maybe there'd be something to that. I know I'm sort of monologuing here. What do you think about what I'm saying? Yeah, look, I think it's like any game. You're going to get skewy lists. So yeah. take Bolt Action as an example. Mm. You get people that run, you know, they'll run an armored car, they'll run a tank. They'll run small squads of veterans. You know, it's a very particular build. Yeah. They might run a fully mobilized, you know, Russian horde in trucks. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you've got 120 Russians in your face. Yeah. So skewy lists exist in every format. And what you do find, as you said, was people start to balance out their lists as the meta sort of sets, sorts itself out and settles in. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we don't have a huge amount of games or a huge um, group of people playing at the moment. I think it's one of those things where people... Certainly, you know, any gamers that have been around for a while will have probably a fantasy army tucked away in the back shelf. Or three. And I think it's probably getting them. <laughs> yeah, or three or four. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a matter of getting them to say, hey, here's a rule set. It's miniature agnostic. It's company agnostic. It's literally, what do you got, you know? And if you've got something that doesn't quite fit or it's not exactly as written, you can sort of play around with, well, it's, you know, do a counts as kind of thing. 
Totally. Uh, I think as they release some more lists, that'll sort of sort some of those issues out. Some people just don't feel comfortable playing with a accounts as unless, you know, there's a specific Ratman list for their Skaven, you know, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think as we go along and we just got to try and, as a community, get, get a few more people in. Mm. Uh, and just, I suppose we probably need to advertise our little gaming days probably a bit better than yeah. outside our own group if we want to get a few more people in. But yeah, I know absolutely. the event beforehand, the one we did before that, we certainly had a few more people there with a bit more army variants. Absolutely. Uh, so there what? was some elves and humans and a few other bits and bobs. And by bits and bobs, do you mean uh, undead eyeballs that are floating out from the ground and <laughs> surrounding I your forces? I refuse to acknowledge their existence. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I love that uh, how salty you are about that army. Anyway, um, moving on. Uh, yeah, man, I, I'm I'm really digging WoW, and I, I definitely need to get some games, some more games in with that. Um, as you say, with, or at least as I was saying, with maybe some slightly larger points. And I mean, we just haven't played a lot with the big toys. Um, we've been playing a lot with. I mean, we have some chariots, we have some war machines. Um, you know, there's been the gy- odd gyrocopter, and you know, occasional big scary monster, but. We yeah. haven't been really getting into some of the, the out there stuff. That I mean, I think that's because Rick himself said um, the game was not balanced with that in mind. That's for more fun games. Um, but I think that's what we're playing in the first. I mean, you know, I think we're just playing fun games. So I think it'd be, uh, it'd be worth to get a few more people out. Maybe some of those fantasy players who uh, have been talking about, uh, you know, wanting to do something besides Age of Sigmar. Um, that might be a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well... Speaking of things that might be a little different from Age of Sigmar and a lot of people t- being very excited about playing another fantasy game, um, Games Workshop, of course, this last weekend um, put out uh, Warcry, which I guess it I guess it wasn't this weekend. It was the weekend before. I just didn't get to it till this weekend. Um, and that is the Age of Sigmar skirmish game. Um, and it's very exciting for me because it's... Um, it's it's very uh, Mordheimy, and I love that game, um, skirmish fantasy, in in sort of a fun uh, narrative driven sense, which I really enjoy. Um, but the base game itself, the the setting of the game, the world of the game, is very much set in sort of the ethos of the original, you know, slaves to darkness um, style chaos books, including I think it's the third ed. Um, Chaos Fantasy Black Book, um, which was my favorite, uh, I think, fantasy battle army book ever made by Games Workshop. And if you look in that book, um, and I have it in the back of a box and I haven't unpacked it yet, there is a snake man, or not a snake man, a, a snake marauder, like marauders who worship snakes um, army. And they or you know, sort of, uh, faction and then there's um, guys who also love crows and things like that and all of a sudden all of that aesthetic has been put into beautiful themed models for this game now Lee you've actually sat down and played this game um, you played the starter set right yeah so just played uh, just store copy just to have a few demo games and get an understanding of it and just see how it plays um, mm-hmm. a lot of it you know sort of sitting down I was think in my mind is this just uh fantasy kill team mm-hmm. um having played a fair bit of kill team for the last sort of 12 months it's yeah. been out yeah it's been out about 12 months yes um yeah they're really good with their timing of releases aren't they yes <laughs> <laughs> i still haven't finished painting my kill team but there's a new game out mm-hmm. uh so yeah you know i was in my mind i was thinking oh it's just gonna be fantasy kill team you know is this something i want to pick up or not but it's actually quite different um very different you aren't building your characters from scratch really with kill team it was i'll buy a marine now i buy his equipment and Mm -hmm. i'll buy skills and you know that sort of thing this is much more set so you got your war band and they've got specific stat cards and they come with specific weapons and you pay specific points yeah they might play i think a thousand points is what they say for standard Mm -hmm. uh we played sort of four or five hundred pointers just to sort of get our heads around the rules Mm -hmm. Uh, and that sort of gave me three or four by three four five figures depending on what was was being taken Mm -hmm. uh and it's it's just sort of runs a bit differently and it's very much a uh it's initiative based and then you alternate activations so getting initiative gives you the opportunity to go first for the turn and then after that, it's just I'll take a turn, you take a turn, and you just 
alternate your model's activation, exactly. um, which is different to Kill Team, which is you win an initiative, you then allocate what each of your guys are going to do on your team, mm -hmm. your opponent then does that, and then you you sort of then do your fight, and off you go, and it breaks down the different steps. So you'll have a movement step. I've got initiative. I activate my first movement allocated guy, then my opponent does. If he's run out, then I do all the rest of my movement guys. Right. Then we go to the shooting. So it's, it's a bit of a different system. It is. Um, the other thing with this is it's a two activation per model. Yeah. So you either, there's no charging. It's just move and attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's range attacks and there's close combat attacks. Uh, the range attacks, ranges were quite short. It's very much a close combat game. Very much uh, certainly so. with the models we were using. There might be other stuff that's a bit more range, but you pretty much just move up and take a swing. And if you're already close enough or in range of somebody, take two swings. Yeah, that's exactly. Uh, and it, it, things have different levels of life and weapons cause different levels of damage. And if you roll a critical, you do an extra massive damage hit. So yeah. you can with certain weapons, theoretically, if you roll a critical, you might take out a little weak minion guy with one hit. Oh, yeah. Um, so it could be quite varied. We found that generally there was a lot of uh, bashing going on. Mm -hmm. In, bash, bash, bash. Next guy, bash, 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 back. So you sort of end up with a little bit of a melee going in the middle. And yeah. um, and it's also random missions and table layout. Yeah. So you've got random cards, flip them over, set your table up, flip over, what's the mission? Mm -hmm. And then you flip over a third thing after you've done all that. And it's uh, table effects. So it could be weather yeah. related or magic or something. I think there's th I think there's three full sets and then there's a twist. So I think there's deployment, there's um, the scenario, and then I think there's uh, the terrain, and then there's like twist on top of that. So the, I've the twist is part of the terrain. Kind of. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have played this as well now. Um, I played on the weekend, but when we played, we didn't have the mission cards. Mine are still in the mail. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't <laughs> bright enough to order them from uh, War and Peace Games before uh, Friday afternoon. So no matter how fast they send things, and they always send things very quickly, there was no way that was getting to me for Saturday, given that our mail doesn't work on the weekends. So, um, so just to go back, I'm going to unpack what you've said just a little bit. Um, so for those who are interested in Warcry, um, basically the turn starts with each player rolling six dice, um, six six-sided dice. And um, basically what you're looking for are combinations of dice, as in doubles, triples, um, and quads. Um, and then you get a wild dice that you can allocate to any of the dice that are there um, to make more combinations. Now, the player who has the most single dice goes first. So the player with, theoretically, the least um, powerful combination of, um, you know, special dice to use that turn gets to go first. So um, they get, you know, little, they get to be a little bit faster. Um, but you can play around with that wild dice again to try and um, win that sort of initiative, if that makes sense. Um, and then... As you were saying, each when you buy models for your warband, you're buying complete models with weapon combinations and armor combinations, and everything's built in, um, which is a little, which felt a little restricting at first until I actually sat down with the cards to do it, and I was pleasantly surprised at. Um, I mean, I I was building cards out of existing armies that I had or building war bands and it was very easy for me to go yep got this got this got this oh cool I have 70 points left over I'll grab one of those and um it felt it felt good um to me anyway and so when you have your war band uh, it, it, certain models have um you know different special weapons that have, have special rules built into that particular model and you can for example spend combinations of those dice from the beginning of the turn um on one of your models um out of activations to do something special like to do a bonus charge or to get an extra attack dice or to get a bonus to your leadership or to chain activate one other model um, and so it's it's very clever, and it gives each warband sort of its own flavor, and each model its own flavor. Um, and then, of course, there are genetic one, sorry, generic um, sort of combinations that you can spend. But you can only spend one per model per activation, unless you your entire warband's been wiped out, and your last you're down to your last man. Then you can spend any combination you want. Which is really? what happened. Oh yeah, which is what happened uh, in my last game. Things I wish I'd known. Yeah, when my orc, um, my orc, Ardboy, um, like the old uh, black orc, 
uh, leader was standing there and uh, I was playing against a uh, good friend of the show, Dave War. And he had, you know, he'd basically taken out, uh, I think, all my, my guys. Um, and he was, he was down to three witch elves, um, one of which was, you know, the badass leader. And I was down to my last one, but I had some awesome combinations and I just went, you know, and orcs are fairly tanky in the game. So he'd put a, a lot of hurt on my leader. But then I went on a rampage and punched out two of them to, you know, two of the minions to death, put some wounds on his big, you know, witch. And then it came down to who got initiative. It was super cinematic. It was an awesome game. But um, yeah, it just, it really, it felt right, if that makes sense. Um, elves are fast. I got outmaneuvered uh, royally. Um, you know, Dave loves the elf two step. Um, you know, being like, oh, I'm going to get away from you, and then I'm going to stab you where you don't want it, and I'm going to go away and come at you and stab you. Meanwhile, I was sort of lumbering after him with the orcs, and I can't, I couldn't quite get my wad to work the right way because I kept rolling low dice so I couldn't get, like, the charge to get close enough, and finally I did, and it just, it felt right. It felt like what you'd expect those races would be like on the tabletop. Um, and man, orcs are tanky. Oh, my God. So hard to get rid of. But they're slow, and you know you can just imagine them being too dumb to die. Um, it just it felt right. Anyway, um, Lee, when you played, you were just playing out of the the war bands in the core set, yeah? Yeah. So we're just using the two out of that. So I played two games with the uh, corn red armor type guys, mm. and my opponent was using the uh, sort of the wild beasty. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Nice. Yeah. So a lot, one of the things that I guess Games Workshop hasn't been advertising as much as I thought they had been, I was aware of this, but um, I posted some pictures over the weekend on Facebook of buying a set of race cards. Um, and people went, wait, what? You can play other races in this game? Um, so not only are there, I think, six, um, possibly seven uh, Chaos Warband races that are either in the core set, two in the core set, and then there's going to be a series of ones that come out after, um, one of which is already out, um, which are, you know, scantily clad people with masks and fans. Um, but they are nine sets of race cards. So you can get the Daughters of Cain cards, you can get the uh, Sigmarines cards, you can get the Iron Jaws, which is what I had, Daughters of Cain, um... Uh, Nagash, um, Legions of Nagash, which are like skeletons and necromancers. You can have the ghouls. Uh, you know, there's just there's three for dis the destruction races, three for order, and um, three for death. And so there's um, a lot of different ways to play a warband in this particular game besides chaos. And though they don't give you the stats for those models, because all of the rules and point values are on the cards themselves, um, you have to go out and buy the cards. Um, because the, the, the models clearly exist on the shelf as it is. And at first I thought, oh, this is a bit of a money grab. Then I found out that the card packs for each race are 10 bucks. Um, I think in Australia they're 12. Um, and that just sounded, you know, perfect. It's like, ah. Oh, you know, I, I went into the store yesterday to buy some white spray paint, and I went, oh, I have a goblin army. There's the set of Warcry cards for goblins for 12 bucks. I'll take those, thank you. Um, but what's cool is the, the, um, the campaign, every race in the game has its own sort of campaign trail um, that you have to follow. Um, so everyone, normally, I guess, if you plan a campaign... Um, you know, you're all fighting over the same resources. And, you know, if someone misses something, you know, misses a game a particular week, you know, they can miss out or fall behind. Or the way I guess this w works, and I'm still figuring out the rules on this, is you just work on your own campaign trail and your own path to glory. And you just use your games to sort of track yourself. Um, but every one of those races has its own campaign trail built in the basic rules. So all you need are the cards. So I bought the basic rules, and then I got the cards for the armies that I already own and have painted for fantasy. Um, Iron Jaws, Daughters of Cain, and Goblins. And all of a sudden, I have three ready-to-go warbands for this game um, with all the bonus material is already in the book for those armies. And all I needed was the cards to play, which I now have. Uh, I think I think that's actually a, a pretty cool maneuver by Games Workshop. I I like it a lot. 
Uh, Lee, what do you think? Yeah, it certainly allows people to use what they've already got. And I think that's a bit of a shift from their past uh, models, of updates mm-hmm. and changing and their business model, if you will. Uh, I think it's good that they're also releasing a whole bunch of new stuff as well, you know, new designs, yeah. get people interested. Totally. Uh, certainly the extra warbands, I have had a look at a couple of them online. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're out this weekend or they just... Are you talking about the the snakes or the crows? Because that seems to be the two that everyone's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So I think they're out this week, but I'm moving house. So they can wait. Um, So yeah, I think it's good that they're releasing and then making it available for other models. My only concern there is the, well, certainly the cards that I've seen are for more of the newer models that they've released. It doesn't Mm. seem to be super backwards compatible. Um, but much like Kill Team, it's it's just whatever their plastic box yeah. kit is. So if you go buy exactly. the Auric box kit or the Gloom Spike kit's box kit, that's effectively your warband mm-hmm. under this system. So that's you know fair and reasonable, and it, it seems like a good way that if you're just interested in a particular you know theme or models, then you could just pick up that one box and grab the card pack, and off mm-hmm. you go. Yeah, it's exactly. Not complex. There's no special tokens or anything you need to play. It's just some six-sided dice, terrain, and a tabletop. Yeah. And it's cool. Um, I really like how it interacts with the terrain. So it's on a smaller size board. It's on the same size board as um, Kill Team. So yep. it's, um, what, 30 by 22? Is that right? Yeah, it's some Ballpark. weird value like that. Yeah, yeah it's about that. And that, that means you can use your Kill Team boards too. So if you've mm. already got terrain and, and that sort of thing, perfectly compatible. You don't need to go buy use terrain necessarily. Yeah. And I have a I have a ton of random fantasy terrain and um, you know city ruins and you know ruined walls and everything else. And so when I was playing with Dave on the weekend, it was just a matter of throwing down a bunch of ruined terrain and you know Bob's your uncle, we're ready to go. Um, and the way it's very parkoury um, for a, a skirmish game, um, it's assumed that people can just climb up walls um, as if there's ladders and whatnot. I mean, if you look at the terrain that comes in the game it looks as though people can just climb up all over the place. Um, and so, you know, if you have ruined buildings and whatnot, again, that matches. Um, but then, it, so you can just climb up and down at will, but you can dive off them and, you know, jump behind someone and then stab them in the back. Um, it, it's, it's, it's more dynamic in a certain way than I think mm. any Games Workshop... Um, skirmish game has been previously then again i haven't played harlequins and kill team and i understand with the flip belts they're kind of all over the joint um but it it feels a little bit like that sort of hyper mobile uh very deadly people die left right and center um there isn't a uh dropout value like there isn't a bottle test in this game um again i need to play more with the cards themselves rather than just playing through the rules but it, it felt good. It felt like a fun game. Is this ever going to be my main game? Probably not. I don't know if it's got the depth for it. Um, I, I, I don't imagine that I'm going to all of a sudden stop doing Cast Dice and start doing a War Cry podcast. But look, I had a blast. I'm looking forward to playing it again very soon. And I want to play more. So I think that is... Um, I think that's a ringing endorsement from me. Um, sounds like you also are looking forward to playing this again soon. Yeah, I think it's a good, uh, you know, you use the old adage, beer and pretzels game. It's yeah. not paperwork heavy. Uh, all your stats are on the cards. Your mm-hmm. special abilities are on the cards. Um, kill team, you have to make a lot of decisions around what special abilities to use each turn. Right. I find this, it's, well, my character's only got one ability he can use. There's a generic list, and then he's got one special thing he can do. Yeah. So I'm really making a, a decision with very limited choices. Kill team, often found myself flicking through the deck. Oh, do I do this? Do I do that? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's a bit more streamlined and sort of a bit quicker. Yeah. Uh, be interested to, again, play, you know, that thousand point level game and see how that goes. And I think when you look at the points cost of stuff, the big, you know, ogre sized mm-hmm. figures are sort of, you know, 250 points and your big combat guys. So a couple of those can chew up your points pretty quick but then there's a lot of stuff i found was sort of 100 to 120 130 points yeah and that seems to be sort of the, the main thing so i think most war bands are going to end up being six to seven models yeah again as we said earlier you're going to get skews someone's going to turn up with a 12 model crew someone's going to turn up with a four model i think it'll be interesting to see what they do yeah 
expansion wise down mm-hmm. the track whether they release new models or new cards to use your existing models but they've got yeah. different abilities you know given that they've released these card packs for the, the initial release for the extra um forces mm-hmm. who's to say they won't just release a, a card pack down the track that says hey here's a bunch of new things and yeah. if you look at the kill team model where they produce commanders and then they produce elites they could do a similar thing with war cry mm-hmm. and um, you know, who's to say we're not going to get a cavalry model in there or a, mm-hmm. some sort of heavily armored skew or ogres or something? Yeah, I was I was thinking about that though, um, because all of the campaign trees are built into the basic rulebook. I wonder if down the track we're going to get another book um, or a booklet um, or the campaign tree for maybe a, a new war band or whatever will be in white dwarf or something because yeah. you can't just sell another set of cards, um, for another existing army. For example, um, I know you have noticed, um, rightly that there's no dwarf war band. Um, and there, there, there are dwarves in the game. There is no Skaven war band. Um, you know, some of these, um, if you're playing, um, what shade spire whatever it's being called at the moment i know there's underworlds and i know there's like beast world or whatever you want to call it coming um if you play that game there's a ton of and those models are gorgeous and they work really well for war cry some of those war bands you just can't use um so i'm assuming that they're gonna come soon um not to mention they're the only scratch the surface of the um sigmarites because uh, there's like a million models in that ga- range for Games Workshop, yeah. and there's only a, a few models that they sell for it, um, as as in cards, so people can use them. So I'm assuming we're gonna get more soon. I mean, clearly yeah, they haven't dropped maybe. all their load at once, but maybe again, it's set in the chaos area of the world, the new mm-hmm. world um, kind of thing. So maybe they don't want to expand. I was actually surprised the Sigmarites and. The high, uh, what are they? Yeah. The water elves, the deep yeah, kin, deep kin made it like we're in there. I was like, well, hang on, that doesn't really fit this chaosy, you know, right. battle arena kind of theme. So it was like, okay, you are just going to add everyone on. So mm-hmm. they probably will add dwarves and skaven and stuff yeah. down the track. But well, skaven are an official. I mean, the the great horn rat is now officially a chaos god. Um, probably more so than Slanesh, because Slanesh has disappeared in the fluff. And the, the Great Horn Rat is now a pure chaos god, and, you know, Skaven are everywhere. Um, yes. It makes sense that they would be in this game. And I'm not yeah. saying that as someone who happens to be, you know, uh, green stuff rollering 200 bases for Skaven models right now. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But um, I really wanted that to be, them to be in the game, and I'm hoping they come soon. Well, Lee, you've uh, you've been here a little while now. I think we should, you know, we've, we've been talking some uh, Warlords, and we've been talking some Warcry, and we've been talking Moving House, but we haven't actually talked about the bolt action event that occurred on the weekend. I guess this not l- this last weekend, but the weekend before um, Operation Bear. Now that was an event that um, was six hundred and sixty-seven points, uh, four games in one day. Uh, and was originally set up with um, me to be the TO. Uh, and because of work obligations and everything else, um, I just didn't think I had it in me to um, run uh, a full event um, and uh, I guess, you know, do, do all the um, working with players um, to, to get it all ready. Um, but I still showed up and helped on the day and contributed something like six tables of terrain and, um, you know, I guess helped you a little bit more sort of sat there and kept you company and packed up terrain and left. Um, Lee, you took over as TO. Um, so I have to thank you very much for that because otherwise it just would not have run. Um, my work has been insane and I was glad that it didn't die. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, no problems. It's easy. Uh, you've done a, a fair bit of the hard work already. It's just wrangling the players and getting them moving mm-hmm. just beforehand and picking out some missions and off we go. Yep. It's not my first rodeo. so Exactly. And you've played in enough things that uh, and run enough events that you can look at player lists and say, oh, yeah, that's that's not great. Maybe you should do something about that. Um, you, you know what to look for. Um, yeah. 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 You're looking for those crazy heavy armor skews and things. I think we're... 
the difference was this year, uh, points limit was 667 points. Correct. So definitely much smaller. We also put in some restrictions around how heavy armor mm-hmm. and how many vehicles and those sorts of things to stop those sort of skew exactly. matches. Um, I think in general, most people just sort of took a balanced force. They took some AT, they took some infantry, those kinds of things. We did have a couple of people that didn't take any anti-tank. Mm-hmm. Some people that uh, had one guy took an artillery piece, no tow. Uh, so across, you know, a couple of missions, obviously wasn't able to bring that on. That hurts. Heavy, heavy AT. And, you know, people pointed that out to him beforehand, but limited by models and uh, decision to mm-hmm. run what he wanted. Um Probably have a bit of a think about that, I think, afterwards. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it was, I think in general, most people just sort of took roughly similar sort of stuff. Wasn't uh, a couple of outliers, a couple of people taking sort of few extra transports, a couple of people taking, mm-hmm. um, you know, all infantry kind of forces, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. But, yeah, we had a, a good turnout. We had uh, 22 starts. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gumby in on the first round for us as I well. Did. So, we ended up finishing with 20 people. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah, we played four games, uh, much like, much like my warlords of where one event I ran, we, we played on four by four tables. That's right. So for bolt action, that's, it's a bit more compact mm-hmm. theory being didn't want people spreading out. Um, you can end up with stuff that just diddles around a bit too much. Exactly. Uh, in hindsight, maybe should have kept it six by four. People did feel a bit pinned in and it, mm-hmm. it got a bit brutal, um, some people are prepared for that a bit better than others, I think. Um, so yeah, it was, it sort of ran pretty well, played the four missions over the day. Uh, only had one person, person go four zero, and that was Tristan, mm-hmm. uh, crushed a few other people. Most of the, most of his opponents ended up going three, one for the day though. Mm-hmm. So they, they were yeah, winning very, and then yeah. sort of got, got there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was points wise. He was a clear winner at the end. Mm-hmm. I then had three people on nine points. Uh, fortunately, one of the so it was uh, three points for a win, one point for a draw, zero points for a loss. So it was a very basic point system. We weren't mucking about with lots of modifiers or anything. Uh, the awards effectively were going to be best allied, best general, best minor power. Mm-hmm. Uh, fortunately for me, the nine pointers ended up being uh, a, a minor power. A, uh, so Tristan was an ally, so he got best allies. Mm-hmm. We had a minor power with Pedro with his Australians. Nice. And then we had uh, Axis with... Um, oh, I'm blanking out. It wasn't Ben because he got best theme. I no. I was thinking he got... Um, it's a Ramon. Yes, I Ramon. believe it was. Yeah, yep, he got best, best uh, Axis. Same crew. Yeah, same group. Uh, so, yeah, it was good. That sort of worked out okay in the end. Um, mm-hmm. Best painted was player voted. Uh, mm-hmm. And then we had a best theme, uh, which was my decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was based on people's fluff. They'd submitted their actual list and their paint job. So how cohesive does the whole sort of thing go together? Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, Ben won that one. These Germans. That's right. And yeah, so it was a good day. And Tristan uh, won. Tristan won best. Oh yeah, uh, Tristan got player voted best painted. Yeah. His new SAS army he's painted up. Yeah, which was quite nice. Well, uh, he's he's been talking about that for quite a while about wanting to really get in there and you know put his best foot forward painting as he does before events. He talks about wanting to win best painted before doing so. Um, and he did. Um, so good for him. I think it was you know people were pretty prepared. Had a few dropouts during the week before, but a few mm. new additions. I think. Yeah, just sort of, you know, you got to pump up events a little bit. Absolutely. Probably might have left it a little late, but we were also restricted on um, our venue space. We're capped at twenty-four players, yeah. so to have twenty-two at the start anyway, we're pretty much near capacity. So mm-hmm. happy with that. Um, had some good sponsorship, War and Peace, oh, as yeah. always, local Australian distributor. Really Man, good. And they came out swinging. They sent all the swag. Um, yeah, we got some good stuff. They, uh, they, guys, uh, War and Peace Games. If you don't, I mean, they support the community in such a big way, and <laughs> um, they were so knowledgeable. I went and bought a few things while I was, you know, I was ordering a few things and told them about the event, and they sent this big box. Um, and eh, you know, they they're not anywhere near us, and they just no. drown us in in product. Um, so um, I know. Just this week, I was thinking, huh, I, I need some Skaven stuff. And went, oh, yeah, War and Peace Games. Hey, they sell Games Workshop now. And, um, you know, was sorted. 
Um, so again, if you're looking for gaming, you know, games, gaming supplies, War and Peace games, man, they ship to your house. They're fast. They're great. I love them. Yeah, Ian and John are really nice guys. Always yeah. talk to them at conventions when I see them. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had Viv from Knights of Dice, who's so good. MDF terrain mm-hmm. extraordinaire and acrylic token maker. Yeah. Um, so he's also now starting to make dice bags mm-hmm. uh, himself. Glad you said so. that. Uh, he donated a couple of those into the prize pool, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. And then we had uh, we got some gift vouchers from Good Games as well, which was the host of the event. They provide us with the gaming space, mm-hmm. um, so we sort of reciprocate with some uh, putting some money through the counter for them, mm-hmm. along with all the cans of Coke and yeah. chips and stuff that gets consumed during the day. Uh, so that was good. And then uh, Warlord Games also yeah. sent us a prize pack that uh, turned up. A couple of days late, but we've distributed out yeah. stuff to uh, people that on the day decided they'd take a chance with a lucky dip to see what Warlord produced provided us. So, mm-hmm. good shout out to them as well. Just, yeah. uh, I think international postage has just ground to a halt in the last oh. few years compared to what it was. Agreed. It's brutal now. Um, I was really hoping that box from Warlord would arrive prior to the event. I mean, they put it out in a way that it should have gotten here and it mm. showed up the Thursday after the event, and you're like, Rrr. That isn't normal, um, but yeah. Just to go back on something you said, um, I picked up a dice bag from Viv uh, that weekend, and um, guys, if you're looking for a good bolt-action dice bag, let me do a little commercial for you here. Um, dice Bags by Viv, if you go to Facebook, um, that's what it's called, and that's Dice Bags by V-I-V. Um, man, I- I- I'm loving my new dice bag. And I have a lot of dice bags, and I'm quite a big fan. So I think you can request the fabric. You can request, you know, um, sort of design sort of thing. It's worth looking at. If you're a bolt action player, they're fantastic. Super good. Anyway, sorry. Um, I have been using mine um, in recent games, and I'm a big fan, and I thought I'd just uh, mention that, yeah, I, I don't often mention where I get some of the things I use in the games that I play, but um, that's definitely worth looking at. Have you seen his? I mean, clearly you saw the ones he donated. Yeah, yeah, just on the on the day. Yeah. I um, I've, I've, got, I've got a few dice bags lying around. Don't know home. what you mean. <laughs> yeah, mm. different things, but uh, yeah, and we also Laser Shark, uh, which mm-hmm. is uh, Mike our Cruise. friend Mike from Yep from Canberra. He mm-hmm. runs a little laser cutting business on the side of his day job, and he produced all the trophies for us mm-hmm. and provided a um bunch of uh, little objective markers yeah. with Operation Bear 2019 on them. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, he goes, uh, gives us a good price for sponsorship and um, provides all that to us, which is really good. Yeah, man. Look, so, I, you know, I, yeah. I, think, I think the key thing there is running an event uh, is easier and it, it's you can get great support out of the community and from um, people just sort of in the industry. It's mm-hmm. just a lot of time it's around just building those connections over time and, and sort of showing that you're, you're running an event for the benefit of people and for an engagement thing, it's, um, you'll get support. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was, I was really, as someone who sort of sat and watched um, a good chunk of the day, I was really impressed with um, the level of hobby. I was able to really walk around and look at people's armies and look at the people's armies with the terrain in the background. So you have beautiful armies, some great looking terrain. And I'm not talking about mine. There was a lot of other beautiful terrain there that wasn't mine. Um, and it, it just, every table popped. Um, people were having a great time. It had, to, it was just a really laid back, cool atmosphere. And I think that had to Largely to do with, you know, how you set it up and ran it on the day, man. And so um, hats off to you because it, it felt really good. And I'm glad I was able to get a game in as the Gumby. Um, I would have been sad had I watched all day and not had a, a chance to get a game in um, and not run the event either, if that makes sense. But I didn't want to play. Um, if I, you know, had stepped out of TOing, I thought that would have been a little cheeky and, like, not right. But... Um, it was just, it was lovely to get, um, my Japanese on the table and play against Viv with him using his new Sikh army, um, which used to be my Sikh army. So I got to show him, you know, go run through the paces. Uh, but it was just a lot of fun, man. Um, and, uh, from talking to people after the event, everyone seemed to have had a blast. Um, so yeah, was that your impression as well? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think 
when it comes to running events, a lot of it's just around having a, a little bit of structure, put some variety. I made mm-hmm. sure the missions were a mix of, you know, kill dice and mm-hmm. objective grabs and sort of getting the opponent's deployment zone to make sure there's a, a bit of a mixture so you get a balance over the day. Um, if people bring different things that are going to be better at some missions than others. Um, and then, yeah, just you create an atmosphere, right? And I think yeah. the venue we use, that they've sort of, you know, it's bright, it's airy, mm-hmm. it's, it's got good it light in nice. there. Smells mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, it's, it's, if you've been to sub, some venues, it's, mm, you know, it's, not it's not nowhere near as fragrant. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we run them on a Sundays because it's a quiet day for the store. And so you get a lot of passers by, though. You get a lot of people who are in there for other things. They just sort of have a sticky beak and ask some questions. And, That's right. Yeah, you know, it's always good to sort of uh, get people having a look uh, but yeah i think everyone had a good time usually we go for a uh, a beer at the bar that's a couple of do- doors down the road mm-hmm. um but i think by the time we'd finished sunday a few people had to shoot off and it just sort of yeah. didn't end up having beers this this time around also it's the middle of winter and it's bitingly cold outside. Yeah, it is and that bar next door is outside <laughs> so, yeah yeah it's the, it's the one disadvantage to it yeah well, I, I guess I have another question for you. As TO, um, uh, I know that I was helping to wrangle games at the end a little bit, but you were doing that far more. Um, did you think that getting four full games in, first of all, tell us how long the rounds were, and did you think that was long enough um, for a small point game? Um, I know you mentioned that you felt that things were a little tight on the table. Um, I think I made that. Did you make that decision? Did I make that decision that it was on a 4 by 4 Because it was to... Um, it was to I make sure that it was spoke short about and it. sharp. We yeah. spoke about it when we, you were talking originally. Yeah, to sort of amongst a little group around. Oh, yeah, and you suggested it, levels, I think. Yeah, yeah. size, and I said, "Well, just run on four by four. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's two reasons. One is space at the venue. Mm-hmm. We can jam more tables in. If you put the six by fours in, you reduce the amount of tables we can set up, and everyone's just a bit more crowded because of the mm-hmm. space. Um, so four by fours just mean we can stagger the tables. You can get more players. You know, if we hadn't done that, you'd take a thirty players away. We'd been capped at sixteen. Yeah. Um, so so part of that's logistics, and then just I think at the smaller points level, you just you just need a smaller table. Otherwise, people just stand up. I mean, you, you lose that flanking ability. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put a couple of the universal rules in as well. Uh, no hidden setups. No. Um, Preliminary bombardments, mm-hmm. uh, no free squads, uh, no free squads, and no crazy fins coming on from the back of the board. <sighs> That's right. Just because of the size. Yeah. Um, we didn't have any fin players, which you know worked out well. Yeah. So you know they weren't disadvantaged because they didn't turn up. Um, right. So yeah, I, I think it's just around setting, thinking about the size of your game, the size of your table, your terrain, and logistics of the space. Um, you know, compared to last year when I ran the Market Garden event and we had half a bowls club and, mm-hmm. we could, you know, we were spread out. People had space to move around between tables quite freely and, and we were able to spread out the, the space we had for the tables. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and that was good. And we even had our map table set up and, and all that sort of thing. So I think it's different events, different spaces, and, and what you're trying to achieve out of it. You know, as a TO, you're giving up your time, and it's not just the time on the day. It's right. it's the pre work, it's answering mm-hmm. the questions, it's putting together player packs, it's contacting stores, booking stuff in, contacting sponsors, getting all that sorted, chasing stuff up, yeah. checking army lists. You know, there's a, a bit of effort that goes on in the background. Um, it's not just on the day. And, you know, yeah. as someone who spent years playing events and then started running them back in the early 2000s, you know, because it was like, well, you know, other people have given up their time. I'll mm-hmm. give up some of my time and tried to balance it over the last few years not to be running events constantly. Um, totally. And so that's why I sort of sort of try and run one bolt action large event a year and then mm-hmm. been organized in these Warlord of, Warlords of Erewhon that's days. Right. But that's, that's a bit more casual and it's just, hey, Here's a date I'm available. If anyone else is free, come on down. Yeah, let's and I'll play some games. Organize some space. We're not, we're not. I'm not dealing with trophies or sponsorship or anything. It's yeah, just exactly. wrangling cats to get someone to roll dice with. To show up, yeah. yeah. Well, all right. I guess I got a few hard questions then. Um, did you think that you had enough time? Do you think that... Um, oh, yeah, the time question. So yeah. I was budgeting on 90 minutes around mm-hmm. with a little bit of padding just to sort of say, well, oh, yeah, you're in your... 
bottom of this turn, all right, we'll just finish pulling these dice. Um, or, you know, is there a resolution or whatever? Well, I think I was a bit optimistic. Mm-hmm. Um, generally, I play a 1,000 points in two and a half hours. Mm-hmm. So I was going for one and a half hours. And my theory was you're going to have most people, people running anywhere between sort of six and eight dice on mm-hmm. average. So I was like, well, there's probably be 13, 14 dice on the table. You should be able to pull a dice and play it, you know, yeah. run through a bag in 15 yeah. minutes. I think people just stick around a bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're taking a bit longer to set up and get themselves established mm-hmm. and deploy and things like that. So I think it's probably even needed a bit more time. Most games were getting four turns minimum done. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was, there was stuff that was finishing in six and yeah. that sort of thing, resolving, or people were getting to five turns and calling it because just skewed results yeah, or whatever. Someone mm-hmm. getting wiped out. Um, but yeah, I was surprised at the amount of games that I was like, hey, guys, what are you up to? Turn three. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you're in your lunch break, so it's up yeah. to you what you want to do. Exactly. Um, but yeah, as the day went on, I think people got back into Agreed. understanding the rules, understanding their army, and they got quicker. And I think it's clearly those that play more frequently than others sort of yeah. ran through quicker. Yeah. And I think, and it's just practice, you know, you do something regularly, you're going to be better at it, quicker at it. And I think I applied my standards to a pool of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I, I was a bit optimistic there. I think I'd definitely bump it out a bit. But I think it also, I mean, we haven't had a major Melbourne event in quite a while. I think people may have just been a little bit out of um, yeah, practice. I think at one point there was going to be a June event, and then I think it got pushed back, and I think it might happen in November or December now. Um, yeah. And then, so between the last one and this one, um, it, there had been a fair number of months, which is something that I don't think we've had in Melbourne for quite a while. No, I was just thinking, I played at CanCon. Mm-hmm. And then we had something in March or April, did we? I thought I ran. Did I run something? I thought I ran something. Yeah. I, I remember it wasn't a big thing. We just had... Wait, did I, I run something? Did someone else? I can't honestly remember. I uh, maybe I was... just played? Because I, I know at the end of last year, I played at your um, Bagration event and loved that. Yeah. No, I played, I've played in Melbourne with my American Buffaloes at an event. Didn't make them. I didn't have them ready for CanCon, so I played them yeah. when we got back. So it must have been something in March. Yeah, so I think yeah, I, I ran think, something earlier this year. Yeah, I would say March. It was at Good Games. I yeah, it was absolutely Good Games. Because um, yeah, so I remember that you and me the running it. Yeah, exactly. So I think it was me um, because <laughs> yeah. you ran the one before it. And um, yeah. yeah, so I think people may have just been a little out of practice it seemed by the end Mm. that um games as you said it sped up considerably um now i was looking across the tables and it occurred to me at the time that a couple of sort of anomalies from melbourne were present one there was a lot of japanese players i think out of the 22 there were three possibly four japanese players playing which never happens um, but I didn't see very many Soviet players. Um, there was at uh, least one. Someone was playing with Lockie's army. Um, yeah. But Lockie wasn't there. I think we had there. two Soviets. Yeah, and there was no Chinese, um, which made me think, which normally you would say, but there, you don't usually see a lot of Chinese, but with John and I in the uh, city, yeah, there John are. John had a family thing come um, up, he dropped during the week. So. Yeah, but between the two of us, so the two armies that have free squads as part of their national rules, you didn't see very many of those, whereas, mm. uh, and Finns weren't there at all. I'm wondering if the, the quote-unquote of reigning in of national rules, because, um, I mean, if you look at the British... They're awesome without the preliminary bombardment rule. Americans yeah. are awesome without the dual um, air. Airplane. And um, I don't think there was a restriction on the Germans. Um, but, yeah, I mean, those were the armies that you tended to see, those three. And, of course, there were others. There were Japanese. There were Australians. Um, there was some cool stuff out there. And I'm not saying that everyone took the same army. They definitely there was some great variety on the tabletops, but there you did tend to see those big nations. Um, do you think the changing of the rules was responsible for that? It's, I mean, I, I, I think don't, it definitely had a yeah. it definitely had an impact. Like, there's a couple mm. of players there that normally play Soviets that weren't. Mm. Uh, I think the Japanese 
possibly uh, I'm not sure whether it's you or um, Rob D having a bit of an influence, but mm. you know we certainly we've run some events um, themed around J- Japanese China mm-hmm. relations um, and just sort of armies based on that. So. <clears throat> um, I think some people have probably picked up and, and want to participate in those days where we're doing a very specific theatre themed yeah. missions and, and sort of events. And it's more of a, just a casual event, if you will, mm-hmm. but it's very structured. So I think some people have been building stuff for that. And I know Ange is pretty keen on those. And so oh, yeah. he brought along his Japanese army. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I think there's just sort of a bit of, you know, undercurrents of themes, you know, when the Operation Seawolf and, and those books came out a few years ago. There's a few people picking up early war armies and getting involved. I think it's just those mm-hmm. general hobby trends that run through every now and then. I think yeah. at the moment there's just a bit of a been a bit of a Chinese Japanese Pacific kind of feel happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm not sure if I mentioned this on the last episode. Um, I know I mentioned earlier in this episode that I played Viv on the weekend. Um, I got to play against um, Viv from Knights of Dice. Had a great time uh, showing him how the Seeks worked. But part of the deal with him and um, giving him my beloved Seek army was um, he hooked me up with some of their... Because they had a sale recently where they were selling off a huge number of their studio... Um, buildings that were pre-painted and beautifully painted, um, sorry, pre-built and beautifully painted um, buildings. And uh, he had a bunch that I was uh, sort of eyeing up. And I said, hey, how about a couple of these? And he put together a little package as part of the deal for the army. And so um, I now have six fully painted, gorgeous Knights of Dice um, urban buildings, like uh, three to four story um, downtown buildings with you know the wrought iron work painted and everything there that I think will work perfectly for Battle of Shanghai games later. I think I just need to get a couple of little nuancey bits to add, which Knights of Dice definitely do as part of their Chinatown range, um, that will sort of make that city pop and make it perfect for those games that we've been playing. Yeah, I think that's good to have themed terrain to go with those themed days yeah, i mean it, it's, there's only so much fighting on a european eastern european village field you can do mm-hmm. trying to keep it nice yeah. and uh themed and, and get that feeling yeah and given how many um desert tables we have in melbourne between the the people who have all yeah. the terrain it is a little like hmm, maybe we need something a little more Asian um, to make this work. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting to have another full table of terrain ready to go. So I'm, I'm very, very keen for the next day to happen so I can throw those down and get some games on the go. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, any other big takeaways from the daily? I, I know I've kind of been I think you may have shared most of them. I just wanted to double check. Uh, I think it's T.O. I missed one of the golden rules of T.O.ing. Oh, yeah. And that is... Remind your players the day before to bring their dice. <laughs> yes. Bring their measuring tapes. Mm-hmm. Bring a copy of their army list. Yeah. And that was about it, really. I think those were the three things that people were missing on the day. Yeah. Uh, I packed a spare set of dice in the morning after a message I received from someone who was already on their way to the venue. And there was some, yeah, yeah. people hadn't printed off or left their army list at home. And so, yeah, you know, the usual across a group of people you know it's always something but yeah i i failed to remind people of the importance of doing so mm-hmm. well i was loaning out my tape measure and dice on the day as well so um you yeah i got there in the end that's yeah. why we have extra dice <laughs> yeah always carry a spare pair in my pocket it was funny uh, um i for the first time and i've been playing bolt action i mean we both have for a very, very long time. And I don't know if you've ever seen this happen either, but for the first time ever, I was watching two players laugh as they were kind of arguing about whose dice came out of the bag in the first pull because one player had put his dice in the dice bag and put it on the table and was pulling out his army, and his opponent put his dice into the bag and neither realized that they had the same colored Uh, dice. (laughs) Yep. 
I just thought, I was like, how did that even happen? I mean, you understand how it happened, but it was just one of those things that in all my years of playing bolt action, I've never seen that. And I just thought that was hilarious. Um, I laughed forever when I saw that. Yeah. Communication is key. Yep. Discuss, discuss with your opponent what the terrain is, what's yeah. in your list. Who's dice a witch? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I do have, and I God, I feel old sometimes because I ask some players, I'm like, oh, is it round? Are we playing with rounds or squares? And they look mm. at me and say, I don't understand your question. And I said, no, yeah. square order dice or round order, like square or round edge. And they're like, I still don't understand. And I'm like, pull out the yeah. two dice. See the square ones and the round ones. And they're like, oh, I've never seen the square ones before. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to go you hang just, my head and feel old. Yeah. Just old dice. I don't even have square ones, so. Oh god, they, you're making they me feel were old, man. They were available to buy at the time when I started, mm -hmm. but someone had told me get round ones. Yeah, and so I got the round ones. Yeah. Yep. That's okay. It is. It is. I just need to uh, put all my square ones in a box, I think, and hide them somewhere. Just remove them from circulation. Yeah. Well, my man, I think um, that is just about everything. I did have one other random hobby-related question, unless uh, you need to run. No, I'm good. So, Lee, a long time ago, um, 14, 15 months to be exact, um, you and I were both interested in a game called Star Wars Legion. Now, we both got the starter set, and we both assembled the models, and I think we both played it a couple times, and I have kept with it. Um, I haven't played tons, but I'm hoping to change that now that I have, um, you know, easy access to my terrain and a gaming table. Um, but you sold yours on, um, and I know that part of that was sort of the same sameness of the game, um, as in like the basic troops were all sort of the same. Mm. Um, there wasn't a lot of variety in the initial releases. Um, I guess as someone whose opinion I think very highly of and who's very analytical um, and, you know, tactically driven, um, now that Legion has sort of been out for a while and we're about to get two new factions um, in the next two months um, that are going to be fully fleshed out with their own character, um, now that we have tanks and we have um, special characters and a variety of leaders to leave the army, and now that they've announced that you're going to be able to get um, an upgrade pack for basic troop squads, so your troop squads aren't all the same models. They, they come in a variety of poses and additional weapons, so you don't just have the two weapon options per squad. Is Legion, do you think, coming into its own? Or are you, what do you think? I mean, as someone who sort of was initially interested and then was sort of turned off by the same sameness of it all, do you think they're getting it right, I guess? Yeah, I think they've obviously matured and, and as, a, as a game, it's matured and grown and, and they've brought in all the new stuff. I mm. think two of the things that made me just... Or three things I, I'll, I'll say made me hand it back mm. and, and move on. One was the models and the quality of them at the initial run. Yeah. Um, given what's possible with plastic models these days and the cost, if you go look at the stuff that gets produced out of Japan for Gundam and, oh, yeah. and those sort of things, mm -hmm. it's plastic sprue frames just like GW and the quality is there. Why can't? And, they, and they're not expensive. You can go to your local hobby store and pick that stuff up. Right. Very reasonable prices. Like, a fraction of the price of buying a, a GW tank or things like that. Why does a company like Fantasy Flight clearly, when they, you know, it wasn't a cheap box set to start with. They just go for such, I suppose, low quality plastics in a sense yeah. compared to what they could have done. Mm, absolutely. Uh, it was just rubbery, lots of mold lines. I was just, I was just yeah. like, if the entire range is going to be like this, I'm going to get super frustrated yeah. cleaning, assembly and painting these. It's just going to get to me. Mm -hmm. at some stage um i quite like the figures and the sculpts as they were i think it was just really around around that sort of point yeah. um the actual gameplay itself i had a few games and i was just sort of like the way the terrain rules worked and you moved and your lines of sight and i was just sort of like it was i suppose in a way i found it was a bit too simplistic mm -hmm. and it was very much around so sort of 
where you put stuff and then it was like well this guy's higher so therefore it's negating your cover and all this sort of thing and I'm like it's sort of they're trying to go for this sort of realistic cinematic thing but at the same time it was like they were completely ignoring a bunch of stuff Mm -hmm. and I was like uh, just I just found it hard to sort of adjust to after playing some other games and at at the same point I was like well I've got all these other games to play as well this isn't really grabbing me. Yeah. I don't feel like I want to put the time, the time. into it. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing was I looked at it and I went, let's have a look at X-Wing. They just keep expanding mm-hmm. the damage to your wallet over time. Yes. To keep up mm-hmm. the escalation and it's, you know, clearly articulated with X-Wing. You know, you needed the latest stuff to yeah. be competitive and that sort of thing. And I was like, it's just going to be an arms race. They're going to release new stuff. Mm-hmm. The original things are bored, are going to get superseded. They're going to go down the path of... You look at X-Wing, you know, start releasing Star Destroyers. I'm like, well, at some stage, they're going to release tanks. They're going to release... Mm-hmm. It's going to, there'll be an AT-AT. I guarantee that they will find a way to make that into the game. Oh, yeah. Um, you would be in, they'd be crazy not to. Well, that's it. And they'll, they'll sell a 30, 30 mil scale AT-AT mm-hmm. and it'll sell. Um, but yeah, it's just... The scale of it and the, the type, I just I just didn't grab me enough. Mm. And, and I love Star Wars. I'm going to Disneyland in a week and a half. And mm-hmm. I have changed travel plans to get there for a, literally a day. I, will, I can squeeze in about eight or nine hours before my flights, between mm-hmm. flights. Um, so I'm going to Disneyland for a day to go to the Galaxy Edge thing because yes. I want to drink blue milk and build a lightsaber. Yes. So... My wife is going to suffer through it, and it's going to be great fun. Mm-hmm. And we'll go on some rides and stuff. But you know, it's yeah, you know. So I love Star Wars, and I love the the whole universe of it and the and everything. But yeah. the game itself, you know, I had high hopes. The initial miniatures looked good, and mm-hmm. I think the miniatures they're putting out now, yeah, and they've they've so gone to the hard better. plastic. Oh, yeah, God, they've, yes. they've gone to hard plastic. The droids, the new droid kits are hard plastic, mm-hmm. and I think that's the, clones, the decision they should have yeah. done from day one. Like, they knew the popularity of X-Wing. Yeah. They were paying for the licensing. Why would you not put your best foot forward from the yeah. start? Mm. And that's sort of the reasons I, I didn't end up, yeah. you know, sticking with it. Uh, and, you know, my wallet is thankful for it because yeah. otherwise I'd have a huge pile of Star Wars miniatures here. I don't know what you're talking uh, about. I'm not looking at those right now. Um, I, I I have bought. I've I've kept going. Um, and I guess I did. I stopped. I guess more. I thought you and I um, both sort of thought this is feeling a little same samey. Um, I also looked at how Armada worked and looked at how X Wing worked, uh, and I just thought, you know, they will come around on this. It will come good. Um, and I sort of banked on that happening. Um, and I think largely, uh, you know, I've been playing um, with a friend of the show, Drew, um, not as much as we probably should, but I'm hoping now that we're both sort of settled a little bit, we can do that. Um, really enjoying playing it sort of in a casual sense. Um, I went with Drew to play in a one-day event recently, and we played in some games, um, and I had a blast. And I, I, be a, I was rolling way hotter than I should have. And so I was sort of blasting a couple of my opponents off the table. Uh, and then I sort of because of that sort of hit that glass ceiling, so to speak, and <laughs> got beaten, <laughs> slapped back down to the bottom tables where I belonged. Um, and it was fine. It was fun. I had a great time doing it. Um, but I think that was right when death troopers were coming out. Um, and so there was actual variety in lists. Um, and I'm hoping now that the, that the new factions are coming out and there are new weapon options that you can add to squads that the whole, like, everyone taking three snipers all the time is going to f- not happen, um, at least as much. I'm just looking to see what happens when you get Tauntauns and Dewbacks and all that, you know, all that fun stuff on the tabletop. Um, but I am super not taking it seriously, it not compared to, oh, I don't know, Bolt Action, for example, or other games that I, I care more about. But, yeah. I'm looking forward to that variety being added in. It's supposedly coming in the next couple of months. Um, by the end of this financial year, all of the squad upgrades for all four factions will be out. And so basic troopers like 40K will have that variety that I've always wanted in that game. And I'm hoping that will really sort of kickstart my enthusiasm. But yeah, I guess that's me. Yeah, um, I think it, it's retrofitting 
existing squads, right? So you're giving yeah. more options for stuff. So it's mm-hmm. not, oh, I've got to go buy a whole new squad. It's oh, I right. buy this little expansion pack of four guys mm-hmm. and all of a sudden I can now change how my existing squads are kitted out a yeah. little bit and give them a bit of variety. But what's also really interesting, it, I mean, people get really tired of looking at the same sculpts all the time. The, those squads come with alternate weapons. So for every one of those four new sculpt guys... Um, not only do they look different, but you can give them a basic laser rifle um, that the regular squads would have or the special weapon. So you have a variety of you want to, uh, you know, I'm tired of looking at the same guys all the time. You can buy a box of those or two boxes of those, kit out the weapons you want. And then the other ones you put the laser rifles on and that just adds variety to your squads. And I thought that was a, a nice touch. I thought that was pretty classy for um, FFG to do. I just, I, I guess they kind of just wish they'd done the Games Workshop thing and had like the Space Marines with the alternate hands. Um, yeah. But I think FFG's learning, and um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I'm, I'm a little sad the clones are going to be in the older material, but the even the older material's gotten better since that initial release and the way that mold lines go. Death Troopers were a million times easier to clean, for example. Um, the mold lines off of than the original stormtroopers, and that's weird given how much detail they have. Um, but they they've clearly figured out where to put the mold lines better, how to do it in a way. And man, those those death troopers are astonishing. I am really looking forward to seeing what the the um, I want to say coast troopers, but I can't believe I just blanked on the name um, from Rogue One. The shore troopers. I'm looking forward to seeing what they oh, look yeah. like in person. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, I'm sure we'll talk more about Legion in a future cast. Um, Lee, you're about to go traveling. Um, I just wanted to say safe travels. Good. I hope it all works. Uh, works out well in the moving the house and the, and the Star Wars and going to Vegas and just have a great time, man. I will. It's a lot going on. <laughs> Yes, there is. The I, next four weeks. <laughs> yeah. But when you come back, um, I hope that you will come on uh, to Talk Shop or come over to the house to play a game. And maybe we'll video it. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll just have some fun. What do you say? I can describe in detail the taste and feel of blue milk. Yes. That will make great podcasting it material. Will. <sighs> and we can talk about the anguish of trying to decide what color lightsaber you want. Uh, uh, right? <laughs> There's four to choose from. I can only pick one. <laughs> Apparently, you can buy the other crystals to change your colors. So I may just have to add on. I was to say, are you purchase. buying all of them? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see on the day. Right. It's, it's still a. I still. I've got uh, two weeks to think about it. So it's, yeah, it's two weeks today. I'm in Disneyland. So yeah. Go from there. My problem is I make poor choices when I have jet lag. Um, mm. And so I know that once I'd be standing there, I'd be like, give, give me the, the one. And then the next day, I'd be like, why did I get the purple one? Yes. I should have gotten the red one. Anyway, <laughs> Why have I got more lightsabers than General Grievous? <laughs> <laughs> yes, right? Oh, man. Oh, man. And uh, on more lightsabers than General Grievous, I think that may be our, uh, our, <laughs> our time to call this a day. Lee, thank you again for coming on, brother. It is always good to talk shop. No problems. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening as well. Um, If you have any feedback for the show, please go to Facebook and type in Cast Dice, C-A-S-T-D-I-C-E. And, uh, yeah, look for us there. Um, I have been blown away recently. Um, It has been... uh, a fun year uh, for work. Um, I've been very busy, and sometimes that you know can can lead to some low morale moments. Um, I'm not going to exaggerate that, but I have never had so much um, feedback for this show or a show that I've done in the past. Um, to all the people who, especially in the last couple of weeks, have reached out to say how much they've enjoyed um, particular game content. Um, with suggestions for shows in the future, or just sharing memes that you think I'd enjoy. Um, Thank you so much. It really does make a massive difference. Um, I appreciate it more than I can express in words. And uh, likewise, thank you very much for listening to this show. I've said it before. I know podcasts don't cost any money uh, for you to download. However, time is money for most of us these days. And in some cases, time is more precious than money. So thank you for taking the time to listen. It is, yeah, very much appreciated. Anyway, 
Look forward to more Warcry uh, content. I did promise a Battletech episode or two. Those are coming in the pipe uh, amongst many, many, many other uh, <laughs> topics for Cast Ice episodes that will be happening very soon. But when you are playing the games that we know and love, I hope that your beverages are cold. I hope your dice roll hot. But more than anything else, I hope y'all are having fun. Good night.